Greetings, YouTubers. This video is part one in a planned series investigating the fuel efficiency of pot stove systems for backpacking. And basically, all the stove tests I've been able to find have a few basic things in common. Whether it's a manufacturer, a retailer, or an editorial review, stoves are most often evaluated by how quickly they can boil a particular amount of water. And those tests are always run with the stove wide open at maximum flame. Additionally, a standardized container is used. So the protocol is essentially various stoves are compared using one flame level, maximum, against a single pot type. Now it makes sense for them to test this way because of the last thing they all have in common. What they are doing are stove reviews. And that's an important distinction I wanted to make at the beginning. This is not a stove review video. I'm not trying to tell you which stove to buy. I'm also not trying to answer the question of which one is fastest. The focus here is on fuel efficiency. So I was curious about how burner size and pot diameter affect the amount of fuel required to heat a specific quantity of water, and how different pairings of stove and pot would compare to each other from an efficiency standpoint. Then I wanted to know how using different flame levels would affect efficiency for each of these pot stove combinations. And I could not find anything like that, so I ended up doing the tests myself. So step number one will be assemble the cast of vessels to be used. So looking at freeze-dried meals from the ones listed in the food chart, this mountain house flavor is typical of the water amount required on the high end. And if you're not familiar with the food chart, check out the link below for a series of videos on calorie density and performance nutrition for backpackers. You can download a copy of the food chart with over 400 dried meals listed, as well as over a thousand other foods in dozens of hiker favorite categories. So anyway, it looks like a half liter pot will hold enough water to make nearly every breakfast or entree out there. And it will also make a decent cup of coffee. So, I thought about looking for a series of vessels with gradually increasing diameter, but with roughly similar 500 milliliter volume. And this would keep it apples to apples as far as boiling capacity went without extra weight from unnecessary size. I also made sure all my containers were made of titanium, just in case there are differences with how aluminum or steel affect efficiency. So at the narrow end, I've got the Tokes 550 pot, which is from their light series. I happen to have the plain one, but they make a version with handles as well. So going one step wider, I took the cup from Snow Peak's Solo Combo set. Now Evernew has an ultralight series from which I grabbed their even wider 570 cup. So notice how as the aspect ratio changes, despite similar volume, the vessel descriptor is different. A tall half-liter container is a pot, while shorter, wider half-liter containers are cups. As we go wider still, cups become bowls. Vessel number four was the Tokes D118 bowl, which exactly the same 550 milliliters as the pot we started out with. And searching around, I found this Keith Titanium bowl for vessel number five. And then when you've outgrown even bowls, the only thing left is a pan. I stole vessel number six from the Tokes 1600 milliliter pot with pan set. And you can see how everybody nests together very nicely. And because the volumes are similar, the wider they get means the shorter they'll be. For stoves, my primary interest was in the burner diameter. I wanted to know things like how a wide flame would perform on a narrow pot, or how a thin little torch would perform with containers of various widths. As it happens, stoves seem to come in just a few recurring sizes. A Pocket Rocket Deluxe has a burner that's almost exactly the same size as a Soto Windmaster. And the difference between things like the uh, Optimus Crux Light and the Ala Camp Kinetic Ultra is negligible. Likewise, the BRS 3000T is very similar to an Ala Camp Ion. And for big stoves, Primus's classic trail stove is practically identical in size to such peers as the GSI Glacier. So that led me to adopt a small, medium, large format for stove selection. For the small burner, I chose the BRS 3000T, super popular with ultralighters. It is, to my knowledge, still the lightest canister stove you can buy. In the medium category, I went with the MSR Pocket Rocket Deluxe. 
Also very popular, it's a multiple award winner of excellent quality. And for the large one, I picked the Primus Classic Trail Stove. Now the stove connoisseur could point out that uh, MSR's Pocket Rocket 2 doesn't fit neatly into this trichotomy. It's sort of a small plus size, if you will. And going back almost a quarter century, there's my Primus Alpine Titanium, complete with piezo igniter and a real wood control knob. It's basically the progenitor to all modern titanium stoves. And if you were an ultralighter back in the 20th century, this was the stove to have. I paid $129.95 for it at REI in 1999. In today's dollars, that would make this a $233 stove. They're long since discontinued, so this one's now a collectible. Still works like new, too. Okay, enough show and tell, back to business. In order to address the apples to oranges problem of comparing stoves, I had to solve the problem of differing outputs. Probably the biggest reason different stoves have different performance in the traditional full blast tests is not due to one design feature or another, but simply because they have different maximum flow rates. Not to be indelicate, but some stoves have bigger holes than others. And with a valve wide open, a big hole passes more gas than a small one. But remember, this is not a stove review. What I'm after is more of a principle, how relative pot and burner diameters affect performance when used in different combinations. To see if size really does matter. Now, I can't just do something like open each stove a quarter of a turn and expect the gas flow to be constant between models. First of all, you can never make sure that the visual estimate of a quarter turn was precisely the same each time you turn the stove off and on again. But importantly, a quarter turn on one stove doesn't mean the same thing as a quarter turn on another. For my tests, I needed the high, medium, and low flames to be exactly the same flow rate across stoves with very different innards. So after much deliberation, I came up with the following arrangement. Instead of mounting directly on top of the fuel canister the way you normally would, I put the stove to be tested on one of MSR's low-down remote stove adapters. It's not the remote part I care about, it's the extra on-off valve. With three of these, I can dial each one in to a preset value for low, medium, high, label them for reference, and remove the wire handles so they can't get bumped or inadvertently changed. They're almost there, but I needed one more inline valve to make it all work. So I got that from the G-Works valve extension hose. This I would connect to the canister. And it would then plug into the low down adapter, which was in turn mounted with the stove. So the stove's valve is left wide open, so it would not be governing the actual flow rate. Stove valves are all different and can't be counted on to provide cross platform consistency. The low down's adapter valve functions as the regulator, one each for low, medium, and high. The valve on the extension hose isolates the canister. It allows me to shut the whole system off so I can swap out stoves and regulators without losing any gas. It's also compact enough that I can measure the canister's weight without needing to remove it. So this setup gave me what I was looking for. A low burn for the tiny BRS would be outputting the very same amount of gas as a low burn for the gigantic classic trail. So any differences in performance should therefore pertain more to the burner's size rather than its innate throughput. And I used a fresh fuel canister for each set of stove tests, that is one canister for the Primus, one for the Pocket Rocket Deluxe, and another for the BRS. And I ran each group of tests in the same order for each stove, so for any biases that may have crept in, at least they would be the same for everybody. And I used the largest canisters to try and minimize the effects of any pressure drop across each series of burns. A full set of tests for each stove used only about a quarter of the canister's fuel. And all of this to keep my numbers as accurate and consistent as possible. And as for the rest of my little garage lab, one of the things I invested in was a good scale. It's repeatable to one hundredth of a gram and comes with a calibration weight for accuracy. I used the scale not just for measuring the weight of fuel consumed after each burn, but also to portion out the water for each boil. 
Testing was done inside my shop for a controlled environment. The temperature was kept by thermostat within a fairly tight range of 48 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that temperature, water is very close to one gram per milliliter, so I effectively measured volume by weight. I used 415 milliliters. It's the high amount of water needed to make a common freeze-dried meal, and it's about as much as you can conveniently manage in a half liter container. Because the scale is repeatable to a hundredth of a gram, my volume measurements were accurate within a single drop of water. And this is what 415 grams, basically 415 milliliters of water, looks like in each of the six vessels used. It's a pretty comfortable fit for all but the pan at the end, which is rated the smallest at 490 milliliters. The water is nearly at the brim, still I was able to safely lift it on and off the stove without spillage, but you do have to be careful. The water temperature during the test was taken with a platinum RTD thermometer accurate to a tenth of a degree Fahrenheit. It's got a max value display to eliminate reading errors while you're simultaneously trying to shut valves off and stop timers. And speaking of timers, I use the stopwatch app on my phone. A note about what my definition here is for a boil of water. I did a video series on backcountry water treatment methods and part one was on boiling versus pasteurization. In it, there's a full discussion of how boiling isn't necessary to make water safe to drink. All you really need to do is reach the pasteurization temperature, which is a lot lower. The point was that you can save both time and fuel if you want to. And that video is linked below in case you're interested. And the one issue with pasteurizing is knowing when you've come to temperature. Boiling is a more obvious distinction that doesn't require carrying any additional equipment like a thermometer or a WAPI. To strike a balance between easy but wasteful and frugal but tricky, I did all tests here to 200 degrees. It's more than enough to disinfect water, cook a freeze-dried meal, or make a cup of coffee. And you'll get good visual feedback with bubbles, but you don't have to waste the fuel required to get to the rolling boil of a full 212. Either way, the endpoint temperature isn't what's crucial to the calculations, it's the delta T, or change in temperature, that matters. After each test, I calculated the amount of heat added to the water and the amount of fuel required to accomplish that change. That allowed me to generate a degrees per gram value for each test. It represents the number of degrees in temperature you can raise the volume of water per gram of fuel spent. Now, personally, I think the amount of fuel required to boil a batch of water is a more useful and intuitive number. So I then converted degrees per gram to grams per boil by fixing the delta T to 155 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's the amount of heat required to get my starting water to just over 200 degrees. So here's a quick rundown of the actual procedure for each test. I made buckets of water that were allowed to reach room temperature before testing began, and which were kept at nearly constant temperature via the climate control in my shop. And I had three buckets, one for each set of tests to be run with the three selected stoves. Zero the scale with an empty pot and pour in water, taking care not to spill any on the scale or the outside of the container. And yes, I did finish each batch off with an eyedropper. A single drop of water could be a few hundredths of a gram, so all amounts are within 0 0.02 grams plus or minus. The filled pot was then visually centered on the stove, which was connected to the fuel canister through my proprietary multi-valve regulator system. The temperature probe was inserted to sit low in the water off to one side and careful not to touch the actual bottle. I would then ignite the stove, start the stopwatch, and begin monitoring the temperature rise. And those tiny little grain of salt sized bubbles don't mean very much. They start almost immediately, well below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And it isn't the start of a boil and it doesn't mean the water is safe to drink yet. Okay, as we continue to heat up, keep your eye on the grain sized bubbles in that middle circle of the pot. At 140 degrees, they still cover it pretty uniformly. But shortly before 150, they start to disappear, being replaced by the occasional launch of bigger bubbles. And by 160 degrees, they've all but disappeared, at least from that central circle area. And this is right around your pasteurization threshold. From 170 on, you can see a steady progression of increased bubble fervency. And by 190, you've got what I'd call a pre-boil, and by 200, the water's surface has begun churning to the extent that it's becoming difficult to see the bottom anymore. And that's an indication you might use in a field to know when you're close enough to quit. Now notice how the temperature continued to rise for a second or two after the flame was shut off. 
and there's residual heat in the stove arms and pot itself that hasn't yet finished transferring into the water. After plateauing for another moment, temperature then begins to decline. Right, so that's the procedure for a single boil. Record the max temperature to calculate the delta T, weigh the canister to get the fuel spent, and start all over with the next one. Now I had three burners and six containers making 18 combinations of pot and stove. Then I had to do all 18 of those arrangements over again with each of the three flame levels, meaning I had to do the whole routine 54 times to capture every combination of this pot with that stove at this level. And there's an old adage that says, a watched pot never boils. I can, at this point, assure you that is not true. Okay, let's get to some results. I started with the Pocket Rocket Deluxe and ran the first set of pot combinations on high flame. So this is a graph of how that stove did on high flame with each of the six pots in my test lineup. And you can see that for the Tox Light 550, which was the smallest diameter vessel, it took just over nine and a half grams of fuel to boil the 415 milliliters of water. Then look at the progression as the pot diameters increase. Same stove, same exact flame level, but the amount of fuel required to boil goes down and down the wider the vessel gets. In other words, it's getting more efficient as you go. A wider pot captures more of the flame, wasting less heat to the environment and putting more into your water. And here's what the actual flame pattern looks like from the Pocket Rocket Deluxe on high with each of the six pots in order of increasing width. You can see that with the smallest Tox 550, Blue flame is clearly being wasted beyond the edges of the bottom. Now, this is still true with the Snow Peak cup, but slightly less so, and with the Evernew cup as well. The Tox D118 bowl is getting close to being big enough to cover the width of the flame, and the Keith bowl is basically there. It has a rounder bottom profile than the other vessels, but that didn't seem to make much difference in the results. And then finally, the Tox 1600 pan looks larger than the blue splash of flame. And note that the progression is a curve, not a straight line. There's a diminishing return wherein you get less and less benefit from each step in diameter. And next, I ran the same stove through the same six pots, but this time all on a medium flame. The big takeaway for me is how all the numbers across the board are lower for the medium flame than the high. So turning your flame down is significantly more efficient no matter which size container you use. A high flame may heat your water faster, but it wastes heat into the environment even faster still. You should expect an efficiency penalty for being in a hurry. Now on medium, the narrowest pot is still more efficient than even the third pot when your flame is on high. And here's the flame pattern series at medium. Once again, you see the progression of increasing efficiency with increasing diameter, but notice how the trend is somewhat flatter this time. Now to finish off with this stove, I ran the tests again, this time using a low flame. And the results were, I confess, a surprise. All the numbers are more efficient than a medium flame, as expected, but look how flat it is. Within a bit of variation, there's basically no trend at all. And think about what that means. With the flame turned down low, it no longer matters which container you use. This is post hoc analysis, but here are some thoughts. The flame we see is just that part of the soot trail hot enough to be illuminated. It's a visual demonstration of just how quickly it cools off and stops glowing. So with the stove on high, that flame splash easily exceeds the edges of a small container. But with the flame set low enough, most if not all of that splash can be captured, even with the smaller pots. And this effectively eliminates the efficiency advantage of a wider container. And here's a look at the flame splash for each pot when set to low. So I reran some of the tests just to check my own accuracy, and the repeatability of tests performed back to back was 0 0.04 grams. I was pretty happy with that. The comeback tomorrow repeatability ended up being 0.17 grams. 
And that could be due to small changes in room temperature, canister pressure, or the re-zeroing of instruments. A roundup to be conservative and call it a possible two-tenths of a gram variation. And if we re-examine the graph with that in mind, basically all of these results are within the margin of error. In other words, they should be considered as essentially all the same. The trend is flat and none of those small variations are entitled to any real significance. And since all stoves are different, none of them can be set by the numbers. Uh, I can't tell you how to get your stove to exactly the same levels that I use for testing. The best I can do is let you see and hear what those levels are like going through the Pocket Rocket Deluxe in question. The low isn't some ultra low simmer mode. There's still a good four inches of flame without a pot. But that rocket sound has all but subsided. And that's the reference I use to approximate a similar level in the field. The next step was to run all 18 tests, six pots at three different flame levels with a stove of a different size. The tiny BRS3000T posted similar numbers with familiar patterns to those of the Pocket Rocket Deluxe. A high flame showed marked improvements in efficiency with increasing pot diameter. With each container, the BRS was slightly more efficient than the rocket. And for brevity, here's what the flame splash looked like on high with three of the containers in small, medium, and wide. And for the BRS stove on medium flame, the pattern was again similar to the rocket. The BRS was a little more efficient with the small pots and a little less so with the widest bowl and pan. And here's the flame splash on medium. As before, a low flame was more efficient still and the container differences were pretty close to statistically flat. And a look at the flame splashes on low. And again, for reference, this is the look and sound of the BRS3000T at each of the three tested flame levels. And for direct comparison, this is a back and forth between the BRS and the pocket rocket, both set to low. As you can hear, there's a noticeable difference in the sound between the two, even though the gas output is the same for each. I use the analogy of a hose with different nozzles. Same pressure, but the bigger burner functions more like a shower head, while the smaller burner acts more like that of a jet stream. To complete my protocol, I ran the 18 boils again with my large burner, the Primus Classic Trail Stove. This was easily the least efficient stove regardless of the container used. It used more than two extra grams of fuel per boil compared to the BRS with all vessel types. And as you can see, it's pretty much what the kids would call a hot mess. The flame splash results in excessive overspill, even exceeding the edges of the widest pan. I think I used that right. Hot mess. Yeah. The Primus was also least efficient for all vessel types with a medium flame. In fact, for all but one container, the BRS was more efficient on high than the Primus was here on medium. There's still a lot of heat spilling past the pot edges. And with the Primus on low, it starts out looking similar to the previous stoves. The trend is flat as a pancake, showing no difference from one vessel to another. But then, right at the end, there's this rise. It's subtle, but distinct, and larger than the margin of error. And as the vessels get wider, they start getting less efficient, not more. As I sat, pondering this conundrum, something occurred to me. The existence of countervailing effects. You see, the increased heat capturing ability of a wider container is only part of the equation. Thermodynamic systems are always a series of both ins and outs, and there are all kinds of heat transfers going on simultaneously, from conductive and convective to radiative and evaporative. And oversimplifying for the sake of this point, while I'm pumping heat in from the bottom, 
it's escaping out the top. And a wider pot can capture more of the flame, but it also exposes a larger face of hot water to the cold atmosphere. So as the flame gets lower, the input-output ratio changes, and at some point there's a flame so low that it can no longer overcome losses to get the job done. Just try boiling a big pot of water with a tea light, and you'll experience the problem firsthand. And it looks like with the Primus stove on low, we cross that tipping point as the pots get wider. And it's a stove nerd thing to be sure, but I thought it was kind of a neat discovery. Unfortunately, while I was looking everything over, I noticed something odd about my times. And time's not used for any of these fuel efficiency calculations. I was recording boil times, but not really paying them much attention in the moment. And I realized that boil times were going up significantly with each subsequent test. And they were steadily rising even across the range where fuel use was remaining constant. Well, the only way to keep running a stove for longer and longer while continuing to use the same amount of fuel is if the flame level is gradually decreasing. So what causes the flame level to go down when my valve system remains constant? Canister pressure drop. The canister pressure drops when the environmental temperature goes down, but I'm in a controlled space, so room temperature was nearly constant. There's a secondary effect, however, according to combined gas law. And as you use up gas from the canister, depressurization causes the temperature to drop. The canister chills itself. So from one test to the next, the effect is very small, but over several runs, it might begin to add up as the canister gets colder and colder. To confirm this, I reran the first pot to double check. And sure enough, it took longer and was more efficient than in the first time. The hallmarks of a slightly lower flame level. So what this does is create a slight bias towards efficiency with each subsequent run. In this case, making the larger pots look artificially more efficient was actually masking some of the countervailing effect. Fortunately, the effect is small in terms of grams per boil, and I can make a fudge factor to give us an idea what the graph would look like without that efficiency bias. The second test of the first pot showed that over the five runs in between, there was a 0.4 gram reduction. Spread that out, and it's just a 0.08 gram per boil step with each subsequent run. And if I add that back to eliminate the bias, it shows the increase in fuel use grows with pot diameter just a little bit more than previously depicted. And before I forget, here's the flame splash for the Primus on low. And the look and sound of high, medium, and low on the Primus Classic Trail Stove. Now, incidentally, the Primus stove has no regulation. The Pocket Rocket Deluxe's valve does have a pressure regulator. So in contrast to the Primus, the MSR's times remain essentially flat, as flat as the fuel consumption numbers, suggesting there's no particular need to correct those for bias. Now, the idea that at low enough flame, an increase in vessel diameter actually starts working against efficiency instead of for it, already has some of you yelling at me about lids. I can hear you, guy in the back, in the gray shirt. Shh. Now, well, after 54 boils plus all the double checks, I was ready to stop watching water heat up. But I realized you'd never let me get away without first addressing the issue of putting a cover on your pot. And after all, it's one of the most common pieces of advice on this topic. Use a lid to make it boil faster. Okay, given what I learned so far, I wanted to make the lid tests as free from discrepancies and biases as possible. So I chose the Pocket Rocket Deluxe for its regulation, removing the need to create a fudge factor for potential pressure drop. And I also resolved to redo all the lid off tests, specifically so the lid on run for the matching pot could be performed immediately after. That way, the before and after effect of the lid would be measured as consistently and contemporaneously as possible. Maximum accuracy would be necessary in order to tease out possibly subtle effects. And remember that my back-to-back -back repeatability was 0.04 grams. So one note about the lid tests. Because of the temperature probe, the lids couldn't quite sit flat. 
Lids don't seal tight anyway, as it's not a pressure vessel, and steam has to be allowed to escape, and some lids even have holes drilled in them for this purpose. So this setup should still be pretty good, though you can argue it's not perfect. Now, I still wanted to see the difference between high, medium, and low flames, but I pared down the pot selection from six to three, and that would give me a small, medium, and large vessel to establish a minimum basis for a trend. So this gave me 18 more boils to perform, lid on and lid off for three pots at three flame levels. So I started with the small pot. Incidentally, the vessels I chose were the three Tox containers from the previous set. So we have the 550 pot, the D118 bowl, and the 1600 pan. And keeping the brand the same would help eliminate even tiny differences between shape, manufacturer, and lid fit. As a reminder, I'm not sponsored at all. I buy all my own gear. I don't get any kinds of free stuff or deals from anybody for anything. Tox just has a good selection of sizes, which makes them ideal for this kind of incremental testing. So here are the results for the Tox Light 550 pot. You've got lid off and lid on for high, medium, and low flame levels. The numbers are presented in grams of fuel required per boil. So some lid effect was evident in each case. With a high flame though, look how small it was. There was only a 0.11, basically just one tenth of a gram of fuel saved using a lid. A narrow pot limits the surface area of the water to limit cooling even with the lid off, and a high flame pumps heat in fast enough to outpace the effect of lost mechanisms. The end result with this particular combination of pot and flame is that a lid barely makes a difference. A lid is only slightly more efficient under a medium flame, saving you a scant 0.17 grams of fuel. From what we've seen so far with the effects of a low flame, we should expect that a lid might make the greatest difference there. And sure enough, the savings from a lid on low are 0.36 grams, more than triple that of high and double the medium. And for our medium sized vessel, the Tox D118 bowl, our developing theoretical construct for pot flame performance predicts that lid savings should be larger than seen with the narrower container. More hot water surface area to lose heat from means more potential benefit from using a lid. So the gold standard for the verification of a theory is the measure of its predictive power. And the medium vessel does indeed show larger lid effects for all three flame levels. And the benefit on a low burn is now at 0.5 grams of fuel saved. And for the widest pan come the largest savings, up to 0.62 grams per boil when using a lid over a low flame. Because I'm a visual person, I like to see everything in a graph. So this is a chart of the lid effect, in other words, the fuel consumption difference between lid off and lid on for all three containers at all three flame levels. And you can see how, as we go from the narrow pot to the intermediate bowl, to the widest pan, the fuel savings from using a lid get larger and larger. So as far as the lids themselves, only the two smallest containers included their own cover. The Tox Light 550 comes with a matching titanium lid. And the Snoke Peaks lid was part of the two pot set it came in and was the only one with a silicone tab for lifting. All the others have uh, metal D-ring style lifters. For the 570 cup, Evernew does make a matching lid, you'll just have to order it separately. And it's the only lid that goes over the top and around the outside of the rim. All the others have more of an inset type of fit. The Evernew cup was also the only container to have silicone on the handles. And they were doing just fine on all the tests until the ginormous Primus burner and its absurd flame spill on high, and that ended up vulcanizing the rubber to the point of crumbling. So Tox does make lids for all their pots, but they consider the D118 to be a bowl. Well, fortunately, it's close enough in size to the 1100 milliliter pot that I could steal that lid for these tests. It sits on pretty well, and if you press the edges down, it becomes quite secure. Now Keith does not make a lid for their bowl, at least not that I could find, so I found a couple of options on Amazon. The Finesse City lid happens to fit like they were made for each other. It is titanium, but it's kind of thick, and that makes it a bit heavy for its class. So I hunted down this universal titanium lid, choosing the 130 millimeter option. 
It also fits well and is substantially lighter. These universal lids appear to be in every respect identical to the Tox lids. And I suspect the manufacturer is selling them on Amazon here unbranded. And then lastly, the Tox pan is itself considered a lid for the 1600 milliliter pot with pan combo. That pot's also for sale for the regular style lid. And rather than buy another pot just for that lid, I found that Amazon also does carry the Tox brand. In this case, get the 145 milliliter size. It does sit flat and won't fall in, but it rides a bit low. So with this pan filled nearly to the brim with water, the lid will touch the liquid when dropped into place. It's stable during a boil though, and in general works fine as a normal lid would. Okay, the gram counters have been waiting patiently for this part. Here are the vessel weights from narrowest to widest. Generally speaking, a square or one-to-one -one ratio of height to width will be the most volumetrically efficient. The wider and flatter you go, the more material you'll need to hold the same amount of water, making the pan shape inherently heavier than the pot. And this out-of-place bump here for the snow peak has everything to do with the thickness of the walls. So both of these are made from 0.3 millimeter titanium, while the snow peak is a much sturdier 0.5 millimeter and that's 167% the thickness of its neighbors on the graph. Here are all the lid weights shown next to the vessels and in the same scale. And just so you don't have to do the math, here are the total weights of vessels plus lids. And because visualization puts everything in perspective, this is how the three stoves use to compare in weight to the vessel lid systems. And you can see how the BRS 3000 is less than half the weight of the lightest pot lid combo, while the Primus is something of a boat anchor. Okay, we're at that part of the video where some people are asking, so which pot and stove should I use? Well, my answer, as always, is it depends. What's your priority? There are more than these two, but the ones I'll focus on are fuel efficiency versus weight efficiency. Simply put, fuel efficiency prioritizes fuel savings over weight, and that means you want to carry the system that will burn the least fuel, even if it's not the lightest possible option. Maybe you've got a long stretch without resupply and you need to make sure you won't run out of gas before you're through. Or you're building an emergency kit with room for only so many canisters and you want to get the most out of them before they're gone. Of all the variations I tested, the single most efficient combination was the widest pan on low flame with the lid on. And that will let you cook your water for just five and a quarter grams of fuel. It's the most fuel efficient choice, even though it's the heaviest container in the group. For a fuel efficiency priority, that's your simple answer. Pan, low flame, lid. Now if weight efficiency is your priority, that's a little bit more complicated. For starters, use a low flame. It saves fuel, which saves weight without any extra equipment required. Other than with respect to time, this is basically a free boost. Next, look at the difference between our pan with low end lid on and the bowl with low end lid on. It's only five hundredths of a gram of fuel. That's barely more than my repeatability error of 0 0.04. But let's assume it's a genuine efficiency differential. At five and a quarter per, you get about 20 boils from one of the small gas canisters, which contain 110 grams of fuel. Well, 20 boils at 5.24 grams each equals 104.8 grams total. And at 5.29 each, it comes out to 105.8. And that means over the life of this entire canister, switching from the pan to the bowl will cost you one gram extra in fuel consumption. Now, a gram of gas is a gram of gas, but the containers don't weigh the same. The Tox bowl lid combination weighs over 27 grams less than the pan lid system. So clearly the D118 presents a more weight efficient option, even though technically its fuel efficiency is slightly worse. You spend one gram to save 27. All right, so how about for the ultralight pot? With low flame, it takes just over five and a half grams. That's a third of a gram of fuel difference between the two containers per boil with lids on. Remember that 20 boils with the pan used a total of 104.8 grams of fuel. 20 boils with the pot will burn 111.4. That means switching from pan to pot will cost you an extra 6.6 .6 grams in fuel weight. As before, though, we have to factor in the weight savings of switching to a lighter, albeit less fuel-efficient, container. 
The Tox Light 550 Plus lid weighs 59 grams versus the Pan Systems 110.3 grams total. Spend 6.6 .6 grams in fuel weight to save 51.3 grams in container weight. So from a weight efficiency standpoint, it seems like another no-brainer. But there is something that I should point out. That 6.6 .6 gram fuel waste switching to the lighter pot is more than the fuel required for one boil. For the pan, 5.24 per will get you essentially 21 boils out of a 110 gram canister. For the pot, you'll only get 19 full boils. If you go for 20, it will sputter out before you're able to reach temperature. So even though the fuel waste is only 6.6 .6 grams, it crosses a threshold that might also cost you a hot dinner on the final night of your trip. But unless you're literally running the canister dry before resupply, that won't matter. Most of the time, you're coming home with some fuel still in the tank. Lastly, let's ask the question, is a lid worth the wait? Remember, this is a weight efficiency question, not a fuel efficiency one. A lid does indeed save fuel no matter which combination of vessel and flame level you choose. The question is, does the weight of fuel saved make up for the weight of the lid itself? The pot is more weight efficient than either the bowl or the pan, and the weight efficiency of a lid will only get worse the wider you go. So let's look at the best case scenario of the Tox Light 550. From the fuel consumption difference chart, with low flame, the lid that comes with a pot saved 0.36 grams of fuel weight per boil. With the lid off, you can get 18 full boils out of a small canister, using a total of 106.56 grams of fuel. I put the lid on, and those same 18 boils will use 100.26 grams of fuel, a weight savings of 6.3 grams. Again, note that this fuel savings is more than the amount for one boil. So using a lid will let you get 19 full boils out of a canister instead of just 18. And that's an advantage with value. But strictly in terms of weight, does a lid justify itself based on these savings? The titanium lid that comes with the Tox pot weighs 16.8 grams. So it actually weighs more than what it saves. The guy in the gray shirt's yelling again. Fair enough, you can get lighter lids. The lightest commercial offering I've ever seen is this little carbon fiber gem from Rue de Locura. And right now it doesn't seem to be available as their only product listing is for trekking poles. I got mine years ago and it weighs in at just about 9 grams. That's almost half the weight of the titanium one, but it's still more than the fuel savings of having your pot covered. Quick and dirty, I cut out a double layer circle of heavy duty aluminum foil, or if you're on the metric system that's aluminium. The it's extremely fragile, but it should trap heat, and I did get the weight down to a gram and a quarter. I don't personally consider this to be a practical replacement for a proper lid. I just did it for you know who. Okay, I think that makes it summary time. In principle, a wider vessel will catch more of the heat from your stove than a narrower one, which may waste heat if the flame splash exceeds the vessel's edges. This was demonstrated with a Pocket Rocket Deluxe stove against six vessels of similar volume but increasing diameter, and the flame on high. A high flame might boil your water faster, but it wastes heat even faster still. So turning down the flame decreases the amount of fuel required per boil, no matter which container you choose. The trend gets flatter though. On high flame, pot diameter makes a significant difference. On medium, that difference becomes less. And on low flame, the trend is essentially flat. It no longer matters which diameter pot you use. They're all about equally fuel efficient. That's with the lid off. The lower the flame, the more a container system benefits from the use of a lid. And a wider vessel loses heat out the top faster than a narrow one, so pans benefit from a lid more than bowls or pots. This means the single most fuel efficient option tested is the widest vessel on low flame with a lid. But fuel efficiency is not the same as weight efficiency, and the most frugal container happens to also be the heaviest. So as it turns out, the fuel savings of a wider vessel aren't justified by that container's increased weight. So the lightest way to go is actually waste a little fuel by using the smallest container. And this extends even to the use of a lid, which saves a bit of fuel but costs you more in grams to carry. So as far as the three stoves tested, the large burner premise was least fuel efficient no matter how you use it. 
But between the medium and small burner stoves, given the margins for error, there's effectively no efficiency difference. So from a weight standpoint, just use the lightest one. And that leaves us with these two best options for kits. For maximum fuel efficiency, use the small stove on low flame with the widest vessel and lid. As noted previously though, the medium container bowl has the exact same low flame fuel efficiency and is light in the pan. For minimum weight, use the small stove on low flame with the smallest vessel and surprisingly no lid. Or if you can manage something lighter than the 6.3 grams in fuel savings, a DIY lid of some sort. That's it for this edition of Watching Water Boil with Gear Skeptic. And there's a bunch more things I'd like to play with in this series. I'm curious about the efficiency of other types of containers to include not just shapes like kettles and canteens, but also materials like the differences between titanium, aluminum, and steel. In particular, I'd like to investigate how wind affects all of this. It's possible that a strong enough breeze could blow away the efficiency gains of a low stove setting, making a stronger flame the better choice in blustery conditions. Air movement might also change the dynamics of using a wider pot and the net value of a lid. Wind might also mean switching stoves, as some have burners that are more protected than others. Stuff for future exploration. So one caution when trying to compare these results with other tests, everybody's numbers will vary based on the differences in their test conditions. If the room or the water is a different starting temperature, or if they use a full rolling boil instead of my 200 degrees, or they test outside in moving air, any of these changes will produce different results. So when I say that you can get 18 boils per canister, that is only under my exact testing conditions. Your mileage will most definitely vary. The point here was just to set controlled conditions so alterations in things like pot size and flame level could be tested against each other apples to apples. The hope being that we could begin to get some insight into how the characteristics of stove pot systems affect their relative efficiencies. And then lastly, it's fair to argue that there's more to cook kits than just water boiling. If you're a camp chef, you might need a stove with good simmering capabilities, or prefer a pan for the ability to fry food and make pancakes. Use this data to inform your own decisions for whatever system best meets your needs. As always, I very much appreciate your time, and thanks for watching.